And Walter is from a family of very, very distinguished journalists and business people. And uh, his grandfather, Clyde Palmer, C.E., I guess it was Clyde, it was right. C.E. Palmer, wasn't it? Clyde ever. <clears throat> uh, from the Texarkana area. Texarkana and then the Texarkana Gazette, the Hope Star, the Magnolia Banner News, the Camden News, the El Dorado Times, uh, the Smackover Journal, uh, good gosh, uh, uh, listen. Smackover Journal's an important one. Yeah, it's the Smackover <laughs> Journal, isn't it? And on and on. Now, what about Arkadelphia? You don't have No, no, no. But we have a Bismarck student here at Bismarck, Arkansas. Hot that Springs, you said, I don't have said Hot Springs. Hot Springs Sentinel Record and so forth. But the, the this is called the Palmer Chain. Now it's, uh, I guess it's still called technically Kennedy Publishing Company. Well, yes, yeah, now it's called Waco Media. Which, Waco Media, yeah. and it's, it's cable system, uh, radio stations, uh, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, of course, and uh, we are really, really privileged that Walter has come. He has since, he has recently acquired the Chattanooga Times Herald. Is Times Free Press. Times Free Press. But his passion is education. That's his passion. And he was just telling me that if you can be passionate at the age 60, he's 59, <laughs> but if you can be passionate about at least one issue or one subject, you're going to live to be 120. <laughs> so he is passionate about education, so he has a long life ahead. So, uh, Walter, we are truly honored that you would come today. And, Talk to us about education. There may be some questions about uh, today's media and uh, your thoughts on that. He is, he is well regarded in the field of, of uh, <coughs> newspaper and journalism all over this country and has served as an officer for the Associated Press and for C-SPAN and, and you name it. So, Walter, we're just proud that you're here. Today. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, David. Uh, you know, I was always flattered if, if David Pryor asked me to teach something because when I was growing up, he was my Sunday school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> I wonder if we could just take a second. Everybody could introduce sure. themselves and say where you're from. Uh, well, I'm Katie Snodgrass. I'm like Dean Pryor said, I'm from Bismarck. Bismarck, right. Um, my dad runs the state park there at DeGray. Oh, great. Um, and I went to Ole Miss. Uh, for undergrad and worked, uh, ran an independent bookstore and worked for books. the oh, Oxford, Mississippi for uh, two and a half years in City Hall and uh, now I'm here. Oh great, my wife went to Ole Miss. Oh yeah? Yeah, and we were over there for the Arkansas game. I feel like I have to be sheepish <laughs> when I'm back in we're Arkansas. We're not very happy with no. Ole Miss this that. morning. We're not yeah, happy with Ole Miss. <laughs> oh boy, we, anyway, that was a basketball game last night. Mm. Hi, I'm, I'm Scott Curran. I'm from Chicago, and prior to coming to the school for the previous four years, I've been practicing corporate law at a mid-sized transactional firm in Chicago. Okay, all right. I'm Dawn Zekas. I'm from South Dakota. Um, prior to coming to the Clinton School, I served in the American Vista program, um, working on service learning and civic engagement issues. Erica Lawler, uh, originally from the Boston area, and following my undergraduate, I served for two years with the AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps, and uh, since then I worked on a voter registration campaign and on a biodynamic farm in Maui. Okay. Good evening, Flowers. I was um, from Pine Bluff. I grew up in California and have been back here for many, many years. Um, I live in Pine Bluff now. Uh, I have graduated from UALR and have a background in poli sci and uh, rhetoric and writing. And um, I work for the Legislative Black Caucus as executive director and served on boards here in the state. That's great. And vote for Power Play next. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. My name is Joe Ballin. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, for the last three years, I've been uh, with AmeriCorps, two years for the National Study Community Corps, and one year as a VISTA. Well, I'm Malcolm Glover. Good to see you again. Yeah, so, right. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm from Bowie, Maryland. Uh, it's in Prince George's County, a couple of miles from D.C. and Annapolis. Uh, my background is in journalism. I'm a graduate of Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida. 
Uh, I interned um, at MSNBC on Harbaugh with Chris Matthews, mm -hmm. and I've also done humanitarian work in China and Brazil. Great. Thanks for coming today. You're welcome. I'm Nancy Mancia, and I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, not New Mexico. <laughs> and um, I, I completed my undergraduate degree in international relations in San Diego at U.S. International University. And then I worked on refugee resettlement in Germany, and then uh, went for a master's degree in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And, and there I also did um, field work in Croatia with, with uh, post-conflict development and integration to the EU. And yeah, come went back to Mexico to live with my dad for a little while in San Diego, and then I, I moved here from San Diego. That's right. That's great. My name is Erica Holland from Connecticut. I uh, went to Trinity <laughs> College in Hartford and double majored in English and sociology. Um, after that, I did Peace Corps service, something I always wanted to do from when I was a child, and uh, ended up in Jamaica uh, working on coral reef degradation issues. Um, awareness campaigns around that and uh, then following that I actually ran a bed and breakfast for four years in Mystic, Connecticut and um, was thinking about going back to school to go to law school and the Clinton school opportunity came up and it correlated with um, my interest in policy and what's going on in the country so I really wanted to, uh, to come here and seize the opportunity. Mm -hmm. and be on the ground floor of an exciting new school. That's great. Boy, a lot of varied backgrounds. That's wonderful. You know, pretty mm -hmm. unique, unique group to be the first class here. So that's, that's great too. Well, uh, do yeah. Do you need a board or do you need a No, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. You know, we'll just have a, con actually, I don't have a formal kind of presentation, but I just thought we, I would talk for a while and, and um, and then we can have a conversation and like to have a lot of input from you all and some discussion or debate or disagreement or anything, anything is fine because uh, one thing I've learned in, in trying to learn more about education is that you know, it's hard to figure out what the answer really is. Uh, uh, as a little background, I wasn't always real passionate about education. Uh, I, I've been, I'd been involved in education some. Uh, I was... Um, chairman of the school board for the school where my kids went to elementary school here in Little Rock, which is the Anthony School. It's a private school here. So I was involved with that, that school uh, some, and I've been involved some with um, my, um, my university. I went to University of North Carolina, and uh, I've been on the board of visitors over there and been involved helping them do, do some fundraising, et cetera. And uh, I guess now I'm, I'm on another school board, which is where my, da my daughters went to boarding school, actually in California, which is a little bit unusual. Most uh, kids go to boarding school from Arkansas and go back east. That's what I did. But they went to school in California, and I'm on the board of that school. So most of my actual, actually most of my University of North Carolina is, a, of course, a public university, but the other school is a private school. So I've never really been involved in, in public school education. And it uh, kind of happened sort of by accident, really, and it wasn't that long ago, four or five years ago. Uh, my wife and I had been invited to go to a retreat at Stanford University at the Hoover Institution, which is sort of a public policy think tank group there. And it went on for like two days, and they had, fast, had fascinating uh, discussion leaders, and they have a lot of things going on simultaneously. So uh, I was in listening to uh, somebody talk about Al-Qaeda and... Uh, yeah, she was in listening to somebody talk about education, so we're sort of the stereotypical couple here, you know. And uh, when she came out, she said, yeah, I've never heard anybody talk about education like these people were talking about it in there. Just a lot of ideas and concepts I haven't read about, haven't heard about. So uh, we, uh, we found out that what had happened, there was a foundation in San Francisco called the Corrette Foundation, Corrette Family. And they had decided they wanted to do a five-year study of uh, public education in the United States, and, and actually outside the United States if it might relate to something that would be beneficial in the United States. And they wanted uh, to round up some scholars uh, who had studied education to go out and do empirical studies and, or analysis of what was going on around the country. Uh, 
you know, uh, what was going on in Florida, what was going on in Minnesota, what was going on in Los Angeles, what was working, what wasn't working. And they didn't want to hire these people for their ideological bent or theories or whatever. They wanted people to go talk about, here's what happened in the real world, here's some empirical evidence, and this was the result, or this is where they are with this. And so uh, the Corette Foundation went to the Hoover Institution and said, can you help us with this project? We don't really know even how to get started on this. And so Hoover took it on, and they hired 11 uh, scholars from around the United States. Uh, one or two were at Harvard, three were at Stanford, one was at the University of Virginia, one University of Chicago, University of Washington. These, these uh, men and women were all, literally from all over the country. Uh, most of them, the one thing they probably had in common is they'd all kind of studied education reform, not just education per se, but, but you know, reform. And all these people were PhDs and, you know, credentialed and, 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 and very also very highly regarded around the country and, and well known. So anyway, they formed a task force. It was called the Corette Task Force. And what my wife wandered into that day was a discussion by several members from the Corette Task Force about, you know, some of their latest findings. And uh, so we learned that they had published already three or four books, one book on teacher quality whole subject of that book was teacher quality. You know, another book on uh, accountability, uh, a, a new move in the United States on accountability and education, et cetera. And most books were written by multiple authors. Uh, it'd be usually be an editor, which was one of the persons on the task force, but they would have different people on the task force write different chapters. And uh, so we picked up three or four of these books and brought them home with us. and. Kind of that was in October, and we were reading these books. And uh, a month later, in November, the Arkansas Supreme Court handed down their Lakeview decision, and it's basically, you know, as you know, said that we had an inadequate, and inequitable system of education. And you know, translated to a practical business person like me is, we've got to revamp our K through 12 education system in Arkansas. So. You know, I was just thinking, gee, if we're going to revamp our system some, why don't we look at what people have done that's been successful and what people have done that's not been successful and try to incorporate some of those ideas into the revamping of Arkansas's educational system. And so, uh, well, it seemed like a good thing to do, except I had no, no idea where to get started on that project. <laughs> So I, I decided I needed to find some people in Arkansas that knew a whole lot about, more about this subject than I did. And, and I did. I found three other fellows who knew a lot about it. Uh, one was uh, Claiborne Deming, who lives in El Dorado, and Claiborne's the CEO of Murphy Oil Company. And uh, Claiborne, has, uh, Murphy Oil has been an Arkansas company since it was founded. And, uh, but frankly, uh, it would be a lot easier to operate Murphy Oil out of Dallas or Houston than it would be out of El Dorado, Arkansas. And this is something they've kind of struggled with. And the main problem they have is, is getting great people to move to El Dorado, Arkansas. You know, because obviously the amenities of living in a Dallas or Houston are greater. But you know, it's a lot less to operate in a town like El Dorado, Arkansas than it is in Dallas or Houston. So that's an advantage. Plus, some people enjoy small town, you know, uh, life, and so they decided, you know, we really need to do something about our number one problem in attracting top flight people to come to work for our company. We've got it, our number one problem is the educational system here in El Dorado. How can we improve it so we can, you know, try to get good people to come here and work for us? And so uh, Murphy Oil and Claiborne really set out to do some very creative things. Um, He'll joke about it being bribery, but uh, they offer rewards to teachers, students. I can't remember if you're a student, you get 1300 on your SATs, maybe it's $500. If you get 1400 on your SATs, maybe it's $1,000. I may be off on the numbers a little bit. I mean, they were giving rewards to students, you know, and they give rewards to teachers who teach advanced placement, and so many of their teachers might you know, uh, their students might get a three or above on advanced placement tests, et cetera. So, and, and they even endowed some, uh, endowed some chairs in the public schools, uh, one, a chair in mathematics 
chair in English so that these people could be kind of the guru for all the other math teachers. And so some very interesting things, and, and Claiborne spent a lot of time and effort on this. And um, another person was Jim Walton. And uh, Jim uh, is uh, has part of the Walton family and is one of the Waltons that spent all of his life in Arkansas. Some of his siblings have, have, have left the state. But Jim hadn't, and Jim really loves Arkansas. He loves Bentonville. And, uh, and he spent a lot of time trying to improve the Bentonville public schools. And he has learned a lot about it. And his brother, John, who, who unfortunately died last year, John had really sort of ended up devoting most of his life, virtually all of his life, really, to education and education reform ideas. And so uh, through that, the uh, Walton family had set, had set their, probably their number one agenda in their family foundation is education reform. And so through that, Jim knew a lot about not only what was going on in Bentonville, what was going on in Arkansas, but what was going on around the rest of the United States. The other fellow who I found that knew probably technically more about it than anyone was Steve Stevens, who was Jack, one of Jack Stevens' sons. And uh, Steve had been involved with the Arkansas Policy Foundation, and they had set up a subcommittee on education to study Arkansas public school education. And Steve somehow ended up being the head of that committee and he really studied it. He, he probably knows as much about the f school finance formula. There aren't very many people in Arkansas that understand that. But he really understood it, and he, uh, he, he just knew it in depth, very, very intelligent. All these, these other three fellows were all very intelligent. Um, they were very, all cared a great deal about Arkansas. They cared a great deal about Arkansas's future, and they cared a great deal about education. So uh, I thought this is a great group to kind of get together and, uh, and we can work on this. And so we sat down and started talking about, you know, the Lakeview decision and, and uh, what that meant and what was probably going to happen and, and how could we help, um, how could we help, you know, improve education in Arkansas and, and how could we try to introduce some of these ideas uh, into, the, into the public policy discussion about what should be done. And um, so that was, uh, that was in November of 2002. And uh, that's when I really got interested in this. Uh, I went back out to Stanford in December and, because I knew so little. And uh, I called one of, the three, uh, one of the three fellows that was on the uh, task force. And I said, could I spend some time with you all if I come out there maybe part of a morning, you know, and just, you know, here we've got the situation in Arkansas, the Lakeview decision, and I need some guidance, you know. And he said, sure, come on out. So we went out and uh, met with three of these fellows all morning, all morning, then had lunch with one of them, a fellow named Eric Hanushek. And they were, they were tremendously hospitable to somebody from Arkansas. What, what on earth was, you know, figure a fellow from Arkansas out here asking them questions. But, I mean, and I asked some really dumb questions. I said, what state has done more with education reform than any other state in the United States. You know? And they said, Florida. I said, Florida? Florida? I mean, my image of Florida is a bunch of retired people. And you had to think, a bunch of retired people, well, why do they really care that much about, I mean, you think that people really care about education or young people with young kids in school. And they said it was just a fluke. It was uh, really Jeb Bush really kind of adopted that as his main thing that he really cared about. And he was, a, he was a Republican governor, and he had a Republican legislature in both houses. He said, that's really hard to find anywhere in the United States. A Democratic governor with two Democratic houses or a Republican governor, two, very, very unusual. And uh, so he was able to push through a lot of legislation that was not practical to do in most states. And... Um, you know, and I said, you know, I just ask a lot of questions. And so I was trying, I was trying to get an education myself on, on, on what they thought was important and what they thought was effective. So um, that's kind of how things got started. And um, we brought one of these fellows back to Arkansas in March of 2003. His name was Eric Hanyashek. He's one of these 11 people. And 
He agreed to come back to Arkansas. All we had to do was pay his travel expenses. Didn't pay him anything for his time uh, to come testify at the House Education Committee and about what he thought. And I'm going to tell you exactly what he thought in a minute because I'm going to go through a little presentation that I've given to some Rotary Clubs around the state. But uh, he, uh, this legislation that had been drafted that we thought was excellent legislation, he testified in favor of it. And he was, it was a bit of a humiliating <laughs> experience for all of us because some of the legislatures sort of took the attitude about, you know, you're some PhD from Stanford trying to come back here to Arkansas and tell us how to run our schools. What do you know about our state? Well, you know, it's kind of, but anyway, um, but he, he took it all in, in good nature and good stride. And, uh, but uh, this bill didn't even get out of the House Education Committee. I mean, it, obviously, it's a, I've never been involved in politics. I've been involved in journalism and business. And I, obviously, uh, I should have consulted my friend David Pryor to ask him some advice here. But because it was a miserable failure on the first go around. After that, what we decided is to, what we needed to do, what, what we, got, we ran ads, for example, in the newspaper that's, that <coughs> talked about this legislation and had every major corporation in Arkansas endorse it. You know, uh, people like Walmart, Murphy Oil, Altel, uh, Axiom, et cetera, and they all ran their SIGs at the bottom of the ads. And, that didn't make any difference at all. So we said, this we're trying a top-down approach. That's not going to work. We need to try a bottom-up approach, and we need to get a grassroots support. If, see if we can get grassroots support for some of these ideas. So with that, what we started doing was, you know, going on the chicken dinner circuit. And uh, I went out, something I'd never done in my life. I probably made 10 or 15 presentations to Rotary Clubs and, you know, State Farm Bureau meetings. and just trying to tell people about these education reforms ideas, you know. And uh, I'll say that was not real effective either, to be real honest about it. I mean, it did expose the ideas to some people, but uh, I remember I was up in Fayetteville and uh, I'd given this presentation. I'd, I'd gone to the, I'd, you know, after the presentation, I had to go to the boys' room. And I'm in there and a guy walked in behind me and uh, he said, I, I heard your presentation, it was very good, but he said, what I want to talk to you about is radiation off these electrical lines that are going over us and how they're causing cancer. <laughs> Boy, I said, you know, this, this is kind of an interesting experience. <laughs> get out here in the real world, you meet some interesting people. And I said, well, I'll talk to you about that later. I've got to get on up to Rogers to do this again. <laughs> anyway, so it was a fun experience. And um, then the governor called a special session of the legislature to deal with this. <clears throat> and what we found is that we had uh, set up a website. We had hired other people to go out and make these kind of presentations at other civic clubs. And one of the things that we did is we ran full page ads about this legislation. And we ran them in, in the Democrat Gazette and ran them in some other newspapers. And each day for 16 consecutive days, we'd run an ad that would talk about education reform and some things that should be done. And uh, I remember that. Uh, Stacy Pittman, who's a wonderful lady, I don't know if y'all have met her, she came to see me about on ad about 10 or 11, and she said, you've got to stop running these ads. It's driving these guys in the legislature crazy. <laughs> and I thought, well, we've hit on something. Something is, is effective here. So we, we finished the series of ads, 16 pages. I actually wrote all these ads. 2003 or four. That was, uh, that was right at the end of 2003. Oh. And the legislature, special legislative session was going in in December, I think, or January. And then we ran it as a 16-page section. And uh, we got more response from that. This might, kind of warms my heart because I'm in the newspaper <laughs> business. You know, kind of encouraging to see that, you know, people actually read advertisements advertisements, they respond to them. And so that was, that was really good. And uh, to make a long story short, the, the legislation passed. And it was called, it's called Act 35. And um, it's, it's got a lot of the really good reform ideas in it. And, uh, but a lot of those reform ideas got delayed. I won't say they got too watered down. A lot of them got delayed. And, uh, We'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the legislation in a little while. Um, but I want to, first, before we do that, I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of my education, what I learned, and kind of starting with sort of a clean slate here, and listening to these people on the correct task force, 
and, and, and getting information. Uh, the first thing I was really surprised, incidentally, uh, this is a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm, I only have one copy. I thought, you know, we're in a small group here. I'd like to stand here. Oh, that's okay. I, I, I don't think I need to, but I will be happy to email you this PowerPoint presentation if anybody wants a copy of it, so I didn't make multiple copies. And you, some of you may not <laughs> want it, but anyway. Uh, the amazing thing is how much money the United States has invested in education. This is a graph, and you can see the slope of the graph. I'll tell you that right here is 1920, and right here is the year 2000. So this is the amount of money spent on K through 12 education in the United States. So the first thing I saw, thought when I saw that graph is those are nominal dollars. And I found out, no, they're not nominal dollars. Those are inflation-adjusted dollars. So we have gone from 1920 when we spent about $600 per pupil in the United States to where we spent in the year 2000, it's been about $7,500 per pupil in the United States on uh, K through 12 education. And that's on an inflation adjusted basis. So, you know, because you always hear we just don't spend enough money on education. So this kind of shocked me that, you know, about that. So I said, well, that's in 1920 is a long time ago, but what, what about more recently? So this little uh, slide shows U.S. public schools and it compares 1970 with 1995. I really need to go back and update this, but frankly, if I hadn't done, I've been doing other things in education. But it shows that real dollars, again, inflation, adjusted for inflation. In 1970, we were spending $3,700. I'm doing pretty good reading these backwards. And in 1995, went to $6,400. So, the, you know, it had really increased. The, uh, the second line is pupils per teacher had gone from 22 down to 17. So class sizes in America had been shrinking during this 25 years. The teachers with a master's degree had gone from 25% to 56%. More than doubled. I think that is phenomenal. That's terrific. And uh, the median uh, teacher experience had gone from eight years to 15 years. And you think, wow, that is great. I mean, not only have we spent a lot more money, but we've got more experienced teachers, we've got smaller class sizes, and uh, we've, we've got uh, yeah, te more teachers with master's degrees. So this ought to be terrific. We should have seen great results. Well, here's almost the exact same years. This is 1970 with 1996. And this is for 17-year-olds in the United States. And there's a test called NAEP. You all may know what NAEP is, the National Asses Ass Assessment of Educational Progress. And it's a test that's given in I th almost all 50 states. I, I think it has to be now under the new No Child Left Behind. And to t first is just a short digression. Testing is of interesting subject, but generally what happens in the United States, every state's got their own unique test to test their students. Arkansas's got the Arkansas benchmark test. California's got the California test. Massachusetts has got the Massachusetts test. Uh, there are some, uh, those are called criterion reference tests. Incidentally, it's a great theory behind those tests. The theory is every state is unique. Every state should have the freedom. This is almost like a state's rights issue. Every state should have the right to create their own uh, educational standards. And once they create those standards, they should be able to create a curriculum to, to teach to those standards. Then they ought to create their own test to test that curriculum and how it's taught. And uh, so that's, it, it's kind of a good theory. The other kind of test that's given is called a nationally norm test. And that's like a Stanford 9. Boy, you, everybody in this room probably took a Stanford 9. It, or maybe it was a Stanford 6 or something when I took it. But, my kids all took it, and uh, it's given to kids all over the United States. It's the same test, not different in Massachusetts and California or Arkansas. It's the same test, and it's a big bell curve, you know, and so you got a lot of kids kind of bunched up at the 50 percent. You got some kids, not very many down here at the 99th percentile, meaning they scored better than 99 percent of all the other kids in the United States on the test. Some of them are down at the fourth and fifth percentile. So. Anyway, NAEP is a, nationally, is a national test that's given, and it's interesting. Between those years, the average NAEP score in the United States went from 285 to 286. 
Now remember, we doubled the number of teachers with master's degrees. We almost doubled real spending in inflation-adjusted dollars. We doubled the experience of teachers, and the score went from 285 to 286 on reading. On math, it went from 304 to 307. And uh, the science score went from 305 to 296. It actually dropped. So, I mean, it's, it was just, it's just, it, these people just said, gee, you know, it doesn't look like just pouring more money into this thing, you know, is doing it. It doesn't look like smaller class sizes are doing it. It doesn't look like more experienced teachers are doing, are getting the job done, you know. And uh, anybody here read Freakonomics? It's a bestseller. <laughs> yeah. I, I just finished reading it myself. And, of course, the whole kind of, this guy really, you know, as you know, he really jumps around in the book a lot. But the one kind of unifying thing is, you know, beware of the conventional wisdom. I mean, the conventional wisdom is small, smaller classes sizes are got to be better. You know, more experienced teachers. So, anyway, um, this basically shows uh, reading scores of of students who are nine years old, thirteen years old, and seventeen year olds. So that. The student, this line down here is the nine-year-olds. This is the 13-year-olds, the 17-year-olds. And this goes from 1980 to almost 2000, probably 1998. The basic thing you see there is the line's flat. You know, over all those years, not a lot of progress. This is a graph. I'm going to run through these a little more quickly. That there, There's really only one test given internationally that's the same. Uh, there's, uh, and it's a math and science test. And... Uh, it's given in most of the developed countries around the, around the world. And so students in America can be compared with students in France and Japan, et cetera. And uh, so um, uh, this, this basically shows that this is called the TIMSS test. I, I can't even remember exactly what that stands for. It's a math and science test. This first column here is nine-year-olds, the next column is 13-year-olds, the next column is 17-year-olds, okay? So the nine-year-olds in the United States scored right about here. There are only about six countries that beat us, most of them in Asia, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, but we beat most of the countries as far as the nine-year-olds went in math and science. But by the time the 13-year-old Americans got around to taking the test, we dropped down here to the middle of the pack. About half the countries are ahead of us, about half the countries behind us. By the time our 17-year-olds take the test, there are only three countries that are worse than the United States. So you have this strange phenomenon where the longer American students seem to stay in school, the worse we do vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, our counterparts around the world. Uh, the one thing the United States when you go back and you look at the success of our country in the, tw in the 20th century, and we had an incredibly successful century in America in the 20th, economically, socially, uh, and uh, economically, no country in the world came anywhere near what the United States accomplished in that hundred years. And one of the reasons is we started early on by requiring our students to graduate, to go to high school. And a lot of countries didn't. But we did. So we had a huge advantage in human capital over those other countries. Today, well, this is not today, 1999, which is seven years ago, this shows high school graduation rates or high school com secondary school completion rates. What percent of students graduated from high school? The United States, 1999, is about 80 percent. And here we are right here in the middle of the pack. You know, now number one is Japan. You might have guessed that. I bet you wouldn't guess the second country, the Slovak Republic. Third is Hungary. These are countries that were never any kind of economic factor before, but they're obviously, you know, investing in education and, and doing a pretty good job. These next charts, which I'll run through quickly, really relate to Arkansas. And so, you know, this is what happened in the United States. We devoted a lot more money to it. Uh, what happened in Arkansas? Were we kind of slacking off in Arkansas while all this was going on? And so this graph is, uh, is public spending in education in, in Arkansas. And I've, the blue graph is in adjusted dollars, and the pink graph is in nominal dollars. So 
In 2001, we spent $2.8 billion on K-12 education in Arkansas. Four years before that, 1997, we nominal dollars was $1.7 billion. I, mean, I was amazed. We went from $1.7 billion to four years later, we're spending $2.8 billion? I thought, that's incredible how much more money we, the economy was booming, tax receipts were flowing in, a lot more money was going into education. And, uh, but even if you adjust it, uh, you know, for uh, inflation, still a lot more money going into, going into uh, K through 12 in Arkansas. Looked at it on a per pupil basis. You know, if you got more pupils, then obviously you'd be spending more money. But on a per pupil basis also, we saw there was a significant increase uh, from 1965 all the way through 2002. Again, I need to update these numbers in both nominal and uh, inflation adjusted dollars. So what's happened to the number of students in Arkansas? Well, it's about 450,000. And it really hadn't changed much in the last 25 years. Arkansas has grown. Our population has grown. A lot of it's been retirees moving into the state. So, and, and probably families are a little smaller than they used to be. So one reason we're spending a lot more money isn't because we've got a lot more students. Uh, that could have been a reason. So you've seen the number of students was flat. What happened with the number of teachers? Well, this graph shows the number of teachers in Arkansas, and you see that graph goes up pretty good. In fact, 1965, we had 17,000 teachers. In 2002, we had 33,000 teachers. So, you know, of course, 65 is a long time ago, but if you look at 1997, we had 29,000, and four years later, we got 33,000. So we're adding a lot of teachers, even though we're only adding a lot of students. So what's going on here? Smaller class sizes, plus a lot of uh, additional people in the schools, aides, you know, teaching aides, and et cetera. And of course, this is just mathematically is the, the size of classes has dropped from 22 students per class to 2002. It's 13 students per class. I was amazed it was that low, 13 students per class. Uh, so. When you start really looking at this, it really is, you know, we've seen the number of teachers go up, but it's not just teachers. In fact, teachers have not gone up nearly as much as other staff. In Arkansas, in 1970, we had 12,000 people who were working in the schools who were not teachers. Today, we've got 33,000 people working in the schools who are not teachers. Wow. Not quite, not quite tripling the number, but a lot of additional people. And the United States is the only nation in the world where over half of the people who work in schools don't teach. Every other country, the majority of people employed by the schools teach, but not, not in the United States. So this is not just an Arkansas phenomenon. This is sort of a, uh, a national phenomenon. We decided to try to break down uh, where are all these non-teaching people, what are they doing, you know? And so, the Arkansas Department of Education has got good statistics on this. So we compared 1995 uh, to 2001, and we wanted to see what was, what was the uh, increase. Well, the big increase is in support staff. They went from 12,000 to 18,000 people in the schools in a matter of six years. So a lot of additional people were getting hired that weren't necessarily teaching. This is something that's put out every year. It's called the Report Card on American Education. It's got so many statistics in it, you wouldn't believe it. It's in, it this is a state-by-state -state analysis. And so you can compare Arkansas with many other states, and, that, and that's what this has done. And what this basically shows is that in uh, <clears throat> what year this was, was in it, well, it does it every decade, every 10 years. So the, the last decade was the 1999 to 2000. We were spending 2.5 billion. Only 213,000 of that came from the federal government. Most, that's pretty typical. Only uh, you know, about 8% of our money came from the federal government. And uh, eight. Uh, eight. Mm -hmm. The state, you know, U.S. average is 6.9%. So most schools are funded locally and, and by, increasingly by states, but mostly locally. But you can see that 
1989, 10 years earlier, Arkansas was spending a billion six, and now they were spending right at two billion six. So in the space of 10 years, we had added a billion dollars a year to spending in Arkansas on K through 12 education. I had no idea what these numbers were, and I was I was amazed, you know. Um, this basically shows, well, you say, well, that's, that's nominal dollars. Let's, let's adjust this for inflation. So you adjust it for inflation, Arkansas is spending two, about 2.5 billion up from a billion nine. Still up about six, 600 million dollars inflation, inf adjusted for inflation. And here we look at uh, how much was spent per pupil. Uh, during the, interesting, during the 1979 to 1989 decade, we had real increases adjusted for inflation, 3% a year in Arkansas. We were 37th in the country. Most other states were, were increasing spending more than we were. But in the 90s, that really changed. And we started spending, our percent increase was 24%. In fact, we were fifth in the United States in how much additional money we put in education, percentage-wise in the 90s. Again, that, that's when our president, Bill Clinton, was, was, uh, was president. Uh, maybe he helped with that. I don't know. I hadn't figured out where all these numbers came from, but I know where they came from. I don't know what, what they all mean for sure. Um, I started saying, well, you know, we, we compare what we spend on education in Arkansas with New York or the District of Columbia or New Jersey or something, but and we, and we don't spend anywhere near as much as those states do. In fact, 1999-2000, New York spent $9,700 per student. They were number one in the country on how much they spent per pupil. Washington, D.C. was eighth, and Arkansas was 42nd. Well, how did the other states around our, bordering Arkansas, how did they compare? We spent 5,500, Tennessee spent 5,300, Oklahoma spent 5,600. Louisiana, 5,700, Mississippi, Mississippi, 4,600, at the bottom of the barrel. But they rank from 30 to 48, and we were 42nd. So, you know, if, if, we aren't, if we aren't spending enough money, it's not like, you know, our, the border states are spending a lot more than we are, and they're really draining our good teachers, et cetera, away, although some of them may be going for other reasons. And uh, the, if you look at teacher salaries, you know, we often hear, well, teachers aren't making enough money. Well, I agree. No teacher, you know, probably it'd be great if teachers could make twice as much money as they make now. But uh, teachers in Massachusetts are the highest paid, 59000 a year, average. New Jersey, 55000 is second. Arkansas is 44th at 35000 But Louisiana is 34000 Mississippi, 33000 Missouri, 37000 Tennessee, 37000 So. Texas, 39,000. We were really not as far behind as I thought we might be on uh, spending. And I it's probably because of all that additional spending that we added in the 90s. We heard a lot about, you know, consolidation. And this just shows a little graph of what consolidation has been since 1965 in Arkansas and school districts. We've constantly been reducing the number of school districts uh, in Arkansas. And, of course, that happened. You know, recently, legislatively, we did get some consolidation, and it's going to continue. There'll be fewer and fewer school districts uh, because a lot of the schools won't be able to meet all the criteria of some of the legislation. So, anyway, uh, the fellows who I met with basically said that three things to really improve your education were accountability, transparency, and choice. And Act 35 in Arkansas in, embodies all three of those. And I want to tell you a little bit about, about what they, they all include. First thing on accountability is annual testing. You'd think, well, gosh, everybody gets tested every year, right? No, they didn't. You know, <laughs> and, and that's one of the things No Child Left Behind required, annual testing in every grade three, three through eight. And so it's something we're going to have to do anyway. So, you know, we feel like if you don't measure it, you don't know for sure how well you're doing. So annual testing was one thing. Longitudinal tracking. Today with computers, you can take a kid in the second grade and, and see how he did in the third grade and how, how he or she did in the fourth grade. And you can track them. And I mean, with computers today, they can keep a track of all 450,000 students in Arkansas. 
right here at the Department of Education. And, and, and it's very helpful to do that if the principal can look at that data, the teacher who's going to get this, the students, she's got 20 students coming into her class next year, she can look at the data, how did this student do in math last year or algebra or whatever. Uh, that was something we were not doing. Nationally norm tests. We think it's great to compare kids in Fordyce and Fort Smith, you know, with each other. But what we really need to do, not just in Arkansas, but every state, we need to compare ourselves with, with students all over the United States because people educated in Arkansas are going to have to compete all over the United States for jobs, not just here in Arkansas. We discovered our state standards. Remember I mentioned every state got to set their own standards? We discovered that our state standards weren't very good. There's actually a foundation that measures state standards, the Fordham Foundation in Ohio. And uh, in fact, they, gave, uh, they give every state a letter grade. Uh, Alabama got a B minus. So I saw Alabama and I turned over to Arkansas. And uh, must be a reason this is hard to pick up. Arkansas got an F for our standards. And so well, why do they give Arkansas? And this didn't, this didn't sit very well when people saw this, especially in the legislature. And a lot of people have been working on education for a long time. And they said, well, the reason it got an F is your, is your standards are just too vague. It's not that they're bad standards. They're just vague standards. Like um, in, in reading, our standard is students understand the goal of reading is to construct meaning. <laughs> you know, what, what does that mean? I mean, a standard in, in, in a state that got a high mark is, you know, you read Shakespeare in the seventh grade or eighth grade or whatever grade you'd read Shakespeare. And you start out, you know, maybe with Julius Caesar and you move up to, you know, maybe Macbeth and, and uh, et cetera. So that's a standard. The idea of constructing meaning isn't a great standard. Well, Arkansas's benchmark test is called the ACTAP uh, test. And uh, if you look at the ACTAP test and you look at the fourth graders that were taking this test, we really look like we're doing great. In fact, from 1998 to 1999, through four or four or five years, we went from 34% of the students scoring proficient to 67% of the students scoring proficient. So that looked pretty good. And if you looked at, at, uh, at re uh, was that, that was math. If you look at reading, we went from 44% of the students being proficient to five years later, 69% of the students being proficient. So this looks pretty good. But there's the NAEP test that's given to everybody. And they determine who's proficient also, not only in Arkansas, but every other test. So whereas in 2002, in fourth grade reading, we said 65% of our students were proficient, NAEP said 29% were proficient. Pretty big disparity there and uh, sort of the same in math. And when we started looking not at the Arkansas test, but at, at the at nationally norm tests given to students all over the country, we started seeing some very flat lines over the years where we didn't seem that Arkansas was really making a whole lot of progress. So I'm not going to bore you with all these, but this was one that showed uh, the state test ACTAP versus the Stanford 9 in math. Actually, fortunately, both lines are going up. Uh, even the Stanford 9 is going up, but it's not going up nearly as much as the ACTAP test. So what is it with these state tests? Well, they're real interesting. They give, when, when students take a test, you get, you get put in one of four categories. You're below basic, or you're basic, or you're proficient, or you're advanced. Every student falls into one of those categories. So the idea is you want to get as many students proficient as possible. Well, uh, it's, there's two ways to do that. One is to teach students so they learn a whole lot more, so a lot of them are more proficient. And the other way to get more students proficient is just to change where you draw the line. And that's basically what not only Arkansas does, but a lot of other states do. A lot of what's happening in Arkansas is just a microcosm of what's going on in most states in the United States. So, in Arkansas, what, what they would do is all the students would take the test, and then they'd say, okay, where are we going to draw the line? Anybody above the line will be proficient, anybody below the line. So as you can imagine, this is subject to a lot of political pressure. 
where to draw the line. And uh, people in the legislature might try to influence the head of, head of the Department of Education, or maybe the Department of Education wants to make themselves look better or whatever. You know, to a business person like myself, I'm skeptical. I mean, I'm a journalist anyway. All journalists are skeptical, right? That, you know, somebody's tampering around. In fact, this year in Arkansas, Ken James, who's a very good commissioner of education, he redrew the line in math, and he raised it. He didn't lower it. He raised it. And, and all of a sudden, a lot of the schools did worse this year than they did last year. And he said, we, he said what, was, what was a proficient level 10 years ago is not a proficient level today, and we've got to raise the bar. Well, good for him, except I'm just not very comfortable with a system where people keep moving the bar around. I'd much rather have a system where, you know, especially in a state like Arkansas, where by and large a lot of kids are below a national average, to know how do we compare with kids around the United States this well, year. So why not just go with the NAEP test and not worry about administering all these other extra tests and then right. let teachers be teaching during that time rather than administering a second right. maybe redundant or inefficient right. test? Well, NAEP is an interesting test. It's, it's not taken by students in all the schools. It's a sample. So it's a random sample, and statistically they say it's valid, but it might only be given to three or 4,000 students in Arkansas. But and why not just have that as the one that's given to every student across the country so that there's a uniform comparative analysis? Yeah, that would probably make a lot of sense. <laughs> But for there, you, what you find when you get into education is there are a lot of different groups that have got a real stake in this, and a lot of people don't want to do that, frankly. Yeah, well, that's some of it, and some of it is people with other vested interests. So. Teachers unions. There's, there's lots of that. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Um, another thing was end of course exams. You know, uh, what would happen is people would take algebra, and they'd do miserably in algebra, but they'd just move on, and then they'd get up to the University in Fayetteville, and they got to be remediated. Fifty-eight percent of the students at Fayetteville a few years ago had to be remediated. Fifty-eight percent of the incoming freshman class. Uh, some states have gone to high school exit exams. That's something we want. If you don't pass the high school exit exam, you don't get a diploma. Uh, they sort of student accountability. Uh, as, in fact, they've, they've gone to that in Florida. Uh, Arkansas's uh, ACT scores, as you can see, those are pretty flat. And I've talked about the remediation rate. So that's accountability. Transparency, what that means is that most people think their child's school is a great school. Frankly, the schools do a pretty good job of selling the parents and everybody, oh, this is a great school, you know, et cetera. And maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. So, Transparency, huh? Good football. A good football team. Yeah, you know, you know who scores in the football team, where they stand. But, but uh, transparency means letting the parents and the other stakeholders, the citizens, everyone, really know how that school's doing uh, compared to other schools in the state, in the nation, etc. And the idea is, if more people knew really, you know, the pluses and the minuses of their schools, especially if they knew the minuses they would bring pressure to bear on improving those schools. But if, it, if it's kind of shrouded in a cloud of, uh, you know, fog, then, then people have a hard time. Uh, what, what we advocated was giving schools a letter grade. This is what they did in Florida. Schools get an A, a B, a C, a D, or an F, a letter grade. And uh, the schools would get the letter grade. So in the Little Rock School District, you might have schools that get an A, and you might have schools that get an F. And uh, in Florida, they, they gave every school one grade. And the people that drafted the Florida legislation and the people that were involved in Florida said that, that was probably a mistake. We probably should have given every school two letter grades, one for overall academic achievement and another for improvement. You know, if you, you sit around, and we could be debate this for a couple hours, what is the best school in Arkansas? You know, is the best school in Arkansas the one with the very highest test scores? Or is it maybe the school that showed the most improvement last year in their test scores? You know, I mean, one school might have gone from the 19th percentile to the 31st percentile in one year, 
Is that a better school than the school that scored at the 88th percentile? It's an interesting question. I don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer, but it, it focuses on how important improvement is, especially in a state like Arkansas where we've got a lot of improvement that needs to be made. Uh, this system of giving letter grades to schools was used in Florida for four years, and, and the results were this, and this is too small for you all to read, but basically this shows five years of giving letter grades in Florida, and it shows the percent of, of schools that got an A, the percent of schools that got a B, C, D, F, et cetera. The first year they did this was in 1999, and 8% of the schools got an A. By 2003, 47% of the schools got an A. Uh, the first year, 3% uh, of the schools got an F. Uh, five years later, only 1% of the schools got an F. So not a lot of schools got Fs either, either in any year, basically. But uh, um, when, so when I looked at this, I said, gee, what does this mean? Maybe we have some great inflation going on here on how they're rating the schools. I don't know exactly how they did it down there. This is something that Florida pointed to, though, as the percent of fourth grade students reading at grade level. That's a pretty easy thing to measure. In 1999, 26% of African American students were reading at grade level. In 2003, 42%. So that showed some real improvement. Hispanics went from 41% reading at grade level to 56%. And uh, white students, 67% to 74%. Everyone was improving. Uh, Another part of this uh, giving grades to, to schools was to reward, reward schools. And uh, the idea was if a school gets an A or a B, they should be rewarded. And the reward was $100 a pupil. Okay? So you have a really excellent school, gets an A or a B. They got, they got 500 kids in the school. 500 times $100, they get $50,000. You know, you get a school like Central High School with 2,000. $200,000. And the legislation was drafted so that the money was spent at the school by a representative of the, the teachers, a representative from uh, the faculty, and a representative from the PTA. And they wanted to buy more computers, wanted to buy more, you know, playground equipment, whatever. But it had to be spent on non-recurring items, not just raise the teacher salaries. Doesn't that just perpetuate an equity among schools that are poorly funded and have students who don't perform well and continue to reward those that already have financial resources and therefore have higher test scores anyway? Well, the, the idea is, uh, conceivably, yes, but the idea is uh, any school can, can get an, I mean, a school could get a D in overall, a school in Eudora, Arkansas might get a D for their overall performance academically, but they might get an A for improvement. So even the, even the poor struggling schools, you know, could still participate in this. Does anybody track that to find out? And, and, and if I'm jumping, if you've already got this coming up, then stop me. But if you yeah. don't, I was hoping maybe you can inter interject more of it into it. You know, you've given us a lot of numbers about states yeah. and numbers per pupil and everything else, but you haven't talked about the difference between urban and rural or well-funded and poorly funded schools. Right, right. Now, I, that probably the only place there's any empirical evidence on this is in Florida, and I don't know really what's, what the rewards have been, you know, Probably somebody's going to do a study on that, but I haven't seen it. Um, so now this has come into Arkansas, but it's pushed, been pushed back several years because uh, the people who, who really resisted this, people who resisted this legislation were the Teachers Union, the uh, School Superintendents Association, and something called the School Board Association. And David, I'm not sure, probably knows oh, about it. Well, it's... You know, it's it's supposed to be representing school boards, but they they banded together to resist this legislation. Um, Are you open? I, I sure, to, absolutely. I, well, it's relevant to what you just said. Um, in the initial conversations, you know, you said that you you know met with some different the guy from Murphy Oil and some different people and mm -hmm. brought in other folks. Um, what efforts were made during the conversations about these types of reforms to really have conversations with groups of teachers and groups of PTA members and school board 
members or superintendents? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure there were. There were, there, were, there were lots of discussions with them, primarily at the legislature, because the superintendents, when the legislature is in session, they all come to Little Rock and they stay just about every day. And, and during those sessions, did, were, were there like one or two major concerns about it that were voiced? Yeah, A, B, C, D, F. They didn't like that. You're labeling schools, you know. You're labeling schools, labeling kids, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, if schools get it, kids get A, B, C, D, F, you know, why shouldn't it? Well, anyway, that got watered, that got watered down to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> okay, so my next question is, where is 5 good or bad? I don't know. Tell me. Is five, you know. So that's, that's what we got in the legislation, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And that's what most states get. They really do resist the ABCDF. It kind of obscures the transparency a little bit. So, uh, by the way, this, just recently, Walter's newspaper did a great service by publishing, this was about 30 days ago, all of the salaries of the school superintendents in the school districts. <laughs> did you, that was an amazing, no, that was about two weeks ago, I guess. That was an amazing revelation. The, disparity of their salaries versus that of the teachers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one more question. Sure. At any point, has anyone sat down with, say, like the legislative auditors, the people that go around and audit all the school districts and talk to them about what they see when they sit down and audit all these school districts? They, they basically uh, see huge variations in, in how things are charged. I mean, you might have a, um, you know, a football coach. Well, he might teach math. So does he get put in the foot in you know, the athletic program, or does he get put in the academic program? And I mean, you see some schools that are spending an enormous amount of money on athletics, and a similarly sad school seems, seems like they're not spending anything on athletics. You know, so there's not much consistency about it. And uh, there was a software program that was written uh, to standardize all this, and it was offered free of charge to be paid for by the Walton Foundation. They offered it to every school district in Arkansas. The only school district that took them up was Benton. Benton. I really, Benton, they said, sure, we'll do it. And they were the only one. I really, these are little fiefdoms almost. They don't want, they want to do it the way they do it, you know. And so, anyway, that's, that I think addresses your question on that. But. It's interesting, it just seems that being public schools, that they say the state legislature says, Right. The superintendents are very effective uh, in uh, with the legislators. Um, the uh, another part I talked about accountability, transparency. The last part was choice. Choice raises a lot of red herrings, and people can get upset about choice and everything. But the the concept behind choice, for example, in Florida, was that if you're a student and you're in a school that gets an F, year after year after year you shouldn't have to stay in that school. You should be able to pack your bags, get out of there, and go to a better school. You know, that's the theory. And that if, and that, that has happened in Florida. Uh, not very many schools, but, but when this, you know, the state gives so much money per pupil to each student, so, so schools like pupils. If they start thinking they're gonna lose pupils, they kind of hit the panic button. And that's what they did in Florida when they started losing these students because they were in F school they started getting serious, you know, and they started having after-school tutoring, and they had tutoring on Saturdays, and, and they got off. That's why not very many schools got an F. And uh, so when we, in Florida, they allowed students to leave public schools and go to private schools. In Arkansas, the decision was made, we're not going to do that. We're not going to get involved with private schools. They can leave a public school and then go to another public school. And frankly, there aren't very many private schools in Arkansas once you get out of Little Rock or Northwest Arkansas or Fort Smith. Um, I just have so many questions. <laughs> well, far away. I don't know where to start, but um, the accountability measures that you're talking about, I became a little bit familiar with because I was working for the caucus actually during that session mm -hmm. when they were working with Mr. Hausen, who I believe was working Housen, with yeah. And the one thing that struck me about the accountability, especially, and you talked about it being delayed because they were primarily the group that talked about 
there needed to be some kind of phasing in. Right. Because even when you talk about choice, especially in Arkansas, a lot of people can't leave. A lot of people right. live have have neighborhood schools and they're not the proximity of the region in which they live does not allow them. They already have to catch a bus. Kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about um, basically dollars leaving the school district and particularly a school district that's historically been mired with a number of problems and you can start with economic issues in the region or race divisions and white flight and all these things. So what happens when you, you know, place those kinds of accountability measures and you've got a Lakeview or a school like that and then some of those kids who can leave do leave, then the school has less resources, fewer resources and they still have the same problems. That's right. Well, let's talk about Pine Bluff, for example. Yeah, let's. Okay. So let's say, hypothetically, in Pine Bluff, you have an elementary school that gets an F, you know, and you, but you've got another elementary school over there that gets a B, okay? And the next year, the school that got an F gets another F, and that other school gets, gets a B. Why not let those kids in Pine Bluff in the F school leave that school and go to the B school? I mean, they get on a different bus. They're still, they're still in the same school district. Well, okay, but even with that example, where the proximity is not so much an issue, you still have a number of kids who, let's say, go to the elementary school in Delaware, who can't go to Watson Chapel. They're, they don't, you know, there are only so many who are going to be able to leave and be able to No, why couldn't they go to Watson Chapel? If, yeah, transportation. I mean, transportation, transportation. is everywhere. Absolutely. Arkansas. Yeah. So, I mean, even aside from that, and even not many districts are like Pine Bluff because we're still dealing with a lot of small town districts where that's not an option. Like the Lakeview example that I gave you. Yeah, Lakeview. A good. lot of schools yeah. are like that. There are some where there were some issues about the consolidation because there was literally like a bridge issue or something. Yeah. Where, you know, I mean, right, right, you, right. I can't remember the specifics, but. The reality is, you know, just like the private school factor that you just mentioned, there aren't even options in terms of public schools for most school <coughs> districts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, beyond Pine Bluff and Northwest Arkansas, Little Rock, and I can't, I mean, I can't think of many others where there are a number, of, let's say, at the elementary schools where there's an option. What about those schools? Right. Well, the, obviously, in, in deep rural Arkansas, there probably there aren't choice probably wouldn't work. But let's go back to Dollar Way. So why can, these kids can't get to Dollar Way? No, from Dollar Way to Watson Chapel because of transportation. Well, some, a lot of them will be left behind. As well. <clears throat> well, okay. Let's talk about transportation. So this bill contemplated that'd be a problem, transportation. So the idea is transportation has to be provided to those students who want to elect to leave that school and go to the school. And either the part, it was, it was drafted so the departing school district would have to pay for it uh, if they cross the school district line. If they don't cross the school district line, then the same, you know, the district provides the transportation. And then you say, well, gosh, you know, what happens to uh, Dollar Way if half the students leave and they all go over here to Watson and they have Chapel? To pay the transportation for the kids. Well, let's say they, they get the buses and they provide all the buses and they got, now you got the transportation. Well, what do you do? You're going to have Dollar Way that's, you know, an F school and, you know, this uh, Watson Chapel that's a B school. But Watson Chapel isn't big enough for all these students. You pull up, you pull up temporary classrooms, you know, and then, you know, what happens to Dollar Way? Dollar Way may close. Is that better or worse than trapping those students in a school that's failing? They're already trapped. And what happens to the half, of, I mean, beyond, okay, let's do something later on. We have a problem. Everybody wants to go to Watson Chapel. Let's take the facilities money over here and build. You're still talking about five or ten years. What happens to those kids who are left behind <coughs> in Galloway in a failing school who can't or don't, for whatever reason, economic, a number of reasons, yeah get an opportunity to get over to Watson Chapel and they're still in that school. Well, I, I feel sorry for them, but at least they, <laughs> they had the opportunity to leave. 
And some of their cohorts did leave because they didn't want to be stuck in that failing school. And is the theory, now granted all this is some theory, but the theory is, isn't it better to let a student go from a failing school to a successful school, and even if they're in a portable classroom, be in a better school than stay in that failing school? And, and maybe the failing school closes. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it struggles along. But, but it, the students that are left behind, maybe because for whatever reason, sometimes they might let, be left behind because they're the quarterback of the team or their girlfriend goes to that school or whatever. They found this to be true in Florida. Some kids had the option to transfer, and some of them transferred, and then they transferred back because they wanted to be on the football team or whatever, you know. But at least the kids who did transfer had the opportunity to do it. And if, if you're stuck in a failing school for two or three years, most of the research shows you're going to fall so far behind, it's going to be so hard to catch up. So it's not a perfect solution, but for the for the kids who want to grab the initiative and get in a better environment, it affords them an opportunity to do that, is the theory. The, that, that theory almost though treats the children like grown people who are looking for a job as opposed to a school <coughs> system of kids who are in an environment where they're supposed to be learning, that where that learning is you know, ostensibly guaranteed by the Constitution of this state. But it's not happening. Right. So is, is the solution then basically to, to say, okay, well, what we're going to do, instead of fixing this school and dealing with the problems that are going on in your school, in your neighborhood, what we're going to do is give you the opportunity to go over there. I mean, so you know, how do you how point, do you how do you fix that school? Many, you know, at some point the musical chairs there aren't enough for everybody, and at some point somebody no you know some mm -hmm. kids have no place to sit. So three kids are sitting on one chair, and the problems that were at Dalway are now at Watson Chapel, and you got these kids left behind for whatever reason who were still in a failing school. Then you have the problems now are shifted and they're everywhere instead of... Right. Well, I don't think you give up on Dollar Way and there's... So what do you do about a failing school? Well, there's lots of things they're doing with these failing schools. They're sanctioning them and they're, you know, they're penalizing them. And this, this legislation wasn't built... There's already legislation on the books to sanction state takeover of the schools. That's been shown to be a pretty miserable failure, not just in Arkansas, but most states, for the state to come in and take over a school. Now, maybe they can come in and do some good things, like if there's financial shenanigans going on. They can clean house, get that over with, start on a little better slate. But Arkansas has had some experience taking over a school in Alzheimer. Yeah, they're involved in Phillips County. Okay. Well, it, it was just taken over. But I mean, the Alzheimer school was taken over four or five years ago, and student you know, test scores haven't improved any there. Uh, One area that I think um, that these numbers that you've been showing us doesn't take into consideration is so much of the child's ability to succeed um, stems from the social capital they have in the home, mm -hmm. um, the stability of the parents' relationship, their educational levels, because yes, you spend a lot of your day in the school, but you spend so much of your life growing up in the home and moving these kids to to a better school system doesn't address the social capital, I think, that they have in the home. And I think that's a large uh, reason for, for the failing schools. So, Did you read this? No, I didn't, I, um, didn't you, have long enough. To okay. Read it. You ought to read this. It really addresses the issue you're talking about. Uh, it's one chapter out of this book. And oh, okay. All right. Great. Um, the, uh, did anyone have a chance to, to read this? It's uh, some of it. We read about KIPP because they're, I do, because they're involved in the, the KIPP school. The KIPP yeah. School yeah. The KIPP, well, the KIPP school is a great example. This is about KIPP, how KIPP got started, et cetera. But, but what these people did is they found examples, not very many, but they found examples in Newark, in New Haven, uh, various places around the United States where you had almost uh, 
all low-income students, mostly minority students, uh, a lot of ki kids from broken homes, this kind of home environment. And these kids are scoring off the charts. You know, it sort of flies in the conventional wisdom. How can these kids learn? They, they come from really difficult, and the, the, basically the truth of the matter, or that what they've determined is it's a lot harder for these students than it is for other students. But it can be done, and it is being done. And, and uh, KIPP kind of started on this whole basis. The, the way the KIPP, you all may all know about how the KIPP school started, but, but this, this, this chapter talks about Rafe Esquith. Do you, you know about Rafe Esquith? He was a teacher in California, went to UCLA, a bright guy, and all his life he wanted to be a teacher. So he got hired by the Los Angeles School District, and he was sent to a great suburban school. And so he loved to teach Shakespeare. And so he took his students down to the Shakespeare Festival in San Diego. And so at the end of the weekend for the Shakespeare Festival, he went up to one of his students and said, did you enjoy the Shakespeare Festival? She said, I thought it was great. And he said, you know, I thought it was great too. And he said, everything was great down here. I thought the hotel accommodations were, were pretty nice. And she said, yeah, they're okay, but nothing compared to where we stay in Hawaii. Well, he drove back to Los Angeles, and that bothered him the whole way back. He thought, these kids don't need me. You know, I need to go somewhere where the kids need me. These kids are going to do just fine. So he asked to be transferred, and he was transferred to South Central Los Angeles to Hobart Elementary. 2,400 students that was an elementary school up through the fifth grade, and he was assigned to a fifth grade class. Hobart Elementary is about half Hispanic and about half Korean. Koreans generally score do pretty well in school, but not these Koreans. These are all low-income, broken family home Koreans. And uh, there were 12 fifth grades, okay? And so Rafe Esquith was a very unusual guy. He would open his classroom at 6.30 in the morning. And usually by 7 o'clock, every student was in there at work. The school didn't start till 8 o'clock, but they let him go in at 6.30 and open his classroom. He had his students stay until 5 o'clock. And he had classes on Saturday mornings. He had classes in the summer. I know this is sort of familiar to you all, but it's kind of interesting to know the origin of all this. So he was doing so well, well, typically in Hobart Elementary of these 12 fifth grades, uh, they would score at about the 40th percentile on these nationally standardized tests, except in Rafe's class, they'd scored about the 90th percentile. I mean, same, you know, students from the same area. Here's one fifth grade that's scoring off the charts with the same kind of students, et cetera. So, obviously a very talented teacher. He gets invited to go to a Teach for America conference in Houston, where Teach for America teachers are going to be there. And so he's sitting there talking about what he does. And there's two guys, there's a lot of people, a number of Teach for America teachers out there, but there were two particular guys that were out there, David Levin and Michael Feinberg, who you may know. They were sitting there listening to him. One of them went to Yale, and one of the, one of the other one graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. They were Teach for America teachers, in, I guess, in Houston. And they, they went up and asked him a lot of questions afterwards. And they went back to their apartment. They lived together, started drinking a couple of beers. And uh, they decided that night they were going to quit teaching. What they were going to do is start a school modeled after Rafe Esquith's classroom. And that's what they did. And that was the first KIPP school. And then David Levin went up to the Bronx and started the second KIPP school. And then Don Fisher, that owned a large percent of the Gap clothing store chain, got real interested in, in KIPP and wanted to expand it nationally. And, and that's really how KIPP began, is it really was modeled off of Rafe Esquith. And it really proves that these kids in really you know, difficult situations can learn just as well as any other kids can. Uh, so, it, yeah. Optimistic in thinking about these issues, although 
I think that teachers do need to be paid more. I think that's something we need to think about because so many people okay. choose not to go into the education profession because there's no money there. So I think that's important. I think having children who are ready to learn, who also have parents that are able to help them with homework is important. But why not deal with implementing programs like what we know that works with KIPP and with, with other programs into some of these schools that we see that are failing? Why does the issue become sending people to somewhere else? And, and the whole idea, because, you know, I was taking a crisis communication course over um, at UALR, that's one of the extra courses I'm taking this semester. And the professor used an analogy, which I thought was so, well, not really an analogy, it was more like a story. But I thought it was so profound. And, and there's this girl walking along the beach. I'm going to get to my point. Yeah. There's this girl walking along the beach. And there are a lot of starfish on the beach. And um, so she starts throwing the starfish back into the ocean. And a guy walks past and says, what are you doing? There are thousands of starfish on this ocean. There is no way that you can save them all. And she said, yeah, but I can save a few. And I was like, wow, that's so profound. But when it comes to education, I think of it differently. I do kind of think along the lines of what Vivian stated earlier. Like, why? It's an issue where I don't feel as though we should say, let's save a few. I want us to save them all. Mm -hmm. And if we see programs that work like KIPP and, and, and other programs, when we see that things like discipline in certain schools are important, um, you know, that's an important part of accountability. You know, just like test scores, you need discipline, you need disciplinaries there, you need administrators who hold students accountable and hold parents accountable and get bad students out. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and so I'm, I'm just wondering why, why don't we look at those ideas like Kip and say, well, let's start implementing those in more schools. We see that it works, we see that it works in areas where there, there's low income, there's not too much great going on, but there's just like this, there's this shiny school on a hill. Kip, we, we see it. Every time we go down um, to Helena, West Helena, um, students are excited, they take responsibility, there's, there's just like this, this whole thing, they wear these vests, you know, right. search right. for certain grades and all that. And I guess, to make a long story short, <laughs> why not implement more of those programs in some of the rural areas, some of the areas in the Delta, some of the areas in the mountains? That would be wonderful. But why do we penalize them? Why do we put into in place legislation that then penalizes them? What we're doing is taking Penalize who? We're taking schools that, you know, we sanction them if they don't pass the, the grade, if they right. don't get right. And so we, so we slap them on the list, and we take more away of what they need, money, or we, we penalize them or sanction them, however it depends. Yeah, they don't take any money away from them. They might slap them on the wrist. Well, leave, I think what Malcolm's saying, though, and what oh. I, why a sanction-based program? Why not an empowerment-based program? If you're getting uh, yeah. it, we're going to come in and lift you up and infuse you with cash. Right. I, I think that, I think you're right. I think sanctions don't work very well. And I think punishment doesn't work very well, not only in schools, but generally in anything. I mean, we go up to the advertising department and say, you aren't selling enough advertising, so we're going to dock you some pay. That doesn't work very well. But if we give people a reward for selling more advertising, that seems to work better. And I, I'm pretty well convinced that, yes, sanctions don't work a whole lot. Rewards do. So we, we need to emphasize rewards. You and know? I don't want to take away from Malcolm's question. I no, but, but to get to your point, I think it'd be wonderful. But let's look at, look at KIPP. KIPP is a charter school. Up until last year, we were only allowed to have 12 charter schools in the entire state of Arkansas. They got legislation passed that doubled that to 24. Still not a lot of schools. A lot of people don't like charter schools. You know, teachers unions don't like charter schools. They, they generally resist them just about everywhere. Uh, so that's a problem. But it, your point is exactly right. Why don't we try to do something about those schools and figure out some way to try to let them advance? You know, at least, you know, look at the, the policies and the procedures and stuff, the, the stuff that works for kids. The things that work for kids, right. Work and see if they can be, you know, maybe like a pilot program with a certain public elementary school to see if it would work, you know, in the Well, that's a great segue because I'll just, we'll talk about the pilot program here in Little Rock, which was the Meadow Clips School. I don't know if you know, you all know very much about the Meadow Clips School, but that's kind of the, I kind of came to the same conclusion you did. If we can't have more charter schools, 
how do we come up with a program that can help these schools that with, with high percentage of low income, high percentage of minority students, especially in Little Rock. You know, Little Rock has been under a desegregation order for about 40 years, and they've been released from all the court orders except one, and that is they have not re reduced the disparity between white and minority uh, achievement. Of course, Little Rock's not unusual. Most places in the United States haven't done that. They've done a very poor job of that. So, uh, so I started trying to think, well, what, what could we do? You know, trying to get another charter school, you're fighting a huge battle. You know, although Little Rock would love to have a KIPP school. There are lots of places in Arkansas that would love to have another KIPP school. One of the problems with KIPP is that it's, you've got to really find the right person to be the principal. You've got to really find great teachers. And it's just, it's not a, they are increasing the number of KIPP schools, but there's demand for them everywhere. And it's just, they don't want to, you know, over overextend themselves and, and start having some failures, you know. Uh, but, so I, I, I decided, you know, sanctions and penalties don't work, rewards do. So what happened is that uh, out at Meadowcliff, Meadowcliff is 86% uh, minority, 85% free and reduced lunch. You go down University, you get to 65th Street and you take a right, and that, that's about where the school is, sort of down southwest Little Rock. So they hired a new principal there about five years ago named Karen Carter. And Karen is a very good principal. And she had enough initiative that she got her grant request in to help uh, her kindergartners, first and second graders, on reading. And over the course of about two or three years, the reading level just really jumped among those students. And so over the course of about three years, some of the teachers left, and she was able to hire her own teachers. And she got some pretty darn good teachers. And so she was worried she was going to lose some of those good teachers. And she went down to the Public Education Foundation in Little Rock, which is relatively new, maybe four or five years old, and said, can you help me? I want to give some of my teachers bonuses because I'm afraid they're going to leave and go to work at Altel or Axiom or somewhere and get a higher paying job. They're really bright, intelligent people, you know. And uh, so the Education Foundation came to me because they knew I had this sort of been going through the same thing y'all are talking about. Sanctions don't work, rewards do. How do we help these, these kind of schools? And uh, I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to t talk to Karen about a, a bonus system for schools. So first I want to go look at the school. So I went out, looked at the school, spent a good bit of time out there, went around all the classrooms, sat down and talked to Karen, talked to a couple of the teachers. And I thought, this, this is a great school. This, this school is going places. In fact, under No Child Left Behind, again, back to the choice item, right now, for the first time about a year ago, kids got to leave really struggling schools and go to better schools. And what I found is kids were transferring into Meadow Cliff. They were transferring into a school that was 85% free and reduced lunch and 86% minority. I thought, wow. This is great. This is a great principal. She's got some good teachers. So I said, you know, I'll be willing to fund a bonus program for you for a year if you let me kind of design the bonus plan, you know. And so she said, what do you got in mind? So in all the reading I'd done, a study about, about uh, rewards, I'd learned there were kind of different ways to go about it. The state of North Carolina came up with a plan that said, okay, we're going to take this school and see how they do on their test scores this year. And next year, we're going to see how they do on their test scores. And if they make a certain amount of progress, we're going to give every teacher in the school $1,000. So that was the North Carolina plan. They really liked that, the way it worked. And the next year, or a couple of years later, they increased it to $1,500 per teacher. But every teacher got the same bonus. I mean, some of the teachers were probably superstars, and some of them were probably not superstars. You know, But everybody got the same bonus. Well, another kind of plan was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which we bought the paper over there and got to know folks and what was going on in the schools over there. And what happened is the University of Tennessee at Knoxville did a study of the 25 best and the 25 worst schools in Tennessee. And nine of the 25 worst schools were in Chattanooga. Well, Chattanooga was mighty embarrassed about having nine of the 25 worst schools. So 
uh, they said, we've got to do something about this. And so a lot of the civic leadership got together over there and said, well, we're going to reconstitute the schools. So when you reconstitute a school, you go in and ask the principal to resign. You hire a new principal. The new principal gets to hire new teachers. You have all the teachers offer their resignation. You know, it's pretty radical. It hadn't been done very often. But they did this with these schools. And they said, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to take a class, the third grade class, and we're going to let them be tested. And then the next year, see how those, those kids do next year. And we're going to base it on a classroom average. So if this classroom really improves, at least, I think it was 10 or 15%, the teacher gets $5,000. Now, if this classroom doesn't make any progress, they don't get a bonus. So now it's not the whole school, it's classroom by classroom deciding who gets bonuses. So when I've been thinking about this, I thought, why don't we try a different system? Why don't we have a bonus on every child? A bonus for every child is very important. Why not have a bonus for every child? So what we'll say is the student shows up in August. About a week or two after they're there, they take a Stanford 9 test. You know what percentile they are in English, what percentile they are in math, what percentile they are in the basic battery of everything. Then about two weeks before they get out of school, they take a Stanford 9 test. So if this kid was at the 20th percentile in the fall, and he moved to the 24th percentile in the spring, he moved up relative to all other kids in the United States that took that test. He made progress. You know, he made progress relative to all the other kids in the United States. I mean, I don't know about all relative to all of the kids in the world during the test. So, but that's, defi that's definite progress. This is not some Arkansas benchmark test where they move the lines around on you. This is, you know, you're pretty confident this kid made progress. So I said, there's a bonus on every child, and if the child makes any progress at all, it's a $100 bonus. They, if they lose ground, there's no bonus. But if they make any progress, there's a $100 bonus, up to 5%. Now, from 5 to 10%, there's a $200 bonus. 10 to 15%, there's a $300 bonus. And if a student moves 15% in one year, there's a $400 bonus. Okay, So the teacher looks out there at the classroom, she's, says she's got 20 students. She's got a maximum of $8,000 bonus. This was something else I heard is that, you know, it's nice to give somebody a $100 bonus or maybe even a $1,000 bonus, but if they're making $40,000 a year, well, that's nice, but it's maybe not as motivating as maybe 10% of your salary, 20% of your salary and a bonus. I've kind of found this to be true in business. I don't know if it equates to education, too, but if you give somebody a bonus of 1% or 2%, it just doesn't have the effect if they get a bonus possibly of 10 or 15 or 20%. So anyway, Karen said, well, I like that plan. Actually, I capped it out at $300. She came back and wanted to raise it to $400, which we agreed to do. And then she said something else was kind of unique. She said, uh, I want everybody in the school to be able to participate, not just the teachers. I want the custodians. I want the secretaries. I want the cafeteria workers. I want everybody in the school to have a vested interest in these kids gaining ground on all the other kids in the United States. And so the bonuses weren't big, but you know, maybe for the, the custodians, the bonus was staggered from $125 up to $500. And in that case, it was based on the whole school average. So, and Karen said, I don't want any publicity about this until we find out how we did. And she was pretty nervous, you know. And I said, whatever, you know. And in fact, we decided we would, we would try to lay low on this and because we thought the emphasis ought to be on how the school does, not who the donor is. So we donated our money to the Public Education Foundation and they, they you know, paid the money to the teachers. And uh, so anyway, we did that. And what happened last year, last academic year, is that if you take the average of all the students in the school, they scored at the 25th percentile. Now there's a school that's 25th percentile, 75% of the students we're scoring better than, than Meadowcliff in the United States. But by the spring, nine months later, they were at the 35th percentile in one year. I mean, you've, you know about the Kipp School. You know that these fifth graders 
went from an 18th percentile in math and the 17th percentile in language to four years later they're at the 75th percentile in language and the 81st percentile in math. I've got copies of this if you want it. It's phenomenal what they've been able to do. Meadowcliff is not a KIPP school. It's not a charter school. It's a regular old ordinary plain vanilla public school that's not ordinary because it's got Karen Carter, it's got great teachers, and now it's got a way to reward teachers. So when the, re when the results came back and the teachers found out how much bonus they made, every teacher made a bonus. See, this program was not designed to penalize anybody. First of all, the teachers, every teacher, all 13 teachers got a bonus. The smallest was $1,800. The highest was $8,600. Now, the teacher that got the $1,800 bonus, she was, uh, she was not at the school when they handed the bonus checks out. So she called Karen and said, how did I do? And she said, well, I'll open your envelope if you want me to. And she said, please do. And she opened the envelope. She said, $1,800. And then she started crying. She was so excited to have gotten this $1,800 bonus. When she got back to Little Rock and was reading the back issues of the newspaper that explained that she had the lowest bonus, that the bonuses varied from eight, she went into Karen and she started crying. She said, Karen, what did I do wrong? I could have done so much better. You know, what, 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 did, I do, what did I do wrong? And she said, I don't think you did anything wrong. You did well. You, some, of your teach, some of your students did outstanding. But let's figure out how you can do better next year. So, you know, this shows, I think, that maybe this will motivate teachers. Not only motivate teachers, well, the, first of all, the whole program cost $140,000. About 100, over 130000 was the bonuses. The rest of the costs were minimal. The Stanford 9 test was not very expensive. We hired proctors to go out to make sure the teachers weren't cheating. I mean, you can imagine there'd be some, if you read Freakonomics, there was some cheating going on in Chicago to get bonuses. We wanted to make sure that didn't happen. Never so, in Chicago. <laughs> so anyway, um, so th that, that's, what, that's what it cost. Um, the, uh, but obviously, you know, this is something we wanted to do to see if it would work, but how long can we do this? You know, I mean, I could get run up by... students are going to need to go to a six o'clock class. I wonder if okay. these are chance that we could come out and visit some of them that could visit the school? They'll visit the Medical Clip School? Absolutely. Here is, and I, I want to pass, I, I oh, did, some of oh, did you? Okay. This is an article in the Wall Street Journal, or a column in the Wall Street Journal that appeared in October about Meadow Cliff. And so, I, you know, you can get a lot of information from that. Um, just as... You'd like to visit the newspaper? Oh, sure. Sure, sure. y'all be welcome to do that. Uh, let me just kind of as a footnote, and I'll wrap it up. What's happened with Meadowcliff is Roy Brooks, who's the school superintendent in Little Rock, has agreed to pick up the cost of Meadowcliff for this year. So they're going to, you know, 140, 130. You don't really know what this program is going to cost. The more it costs, the better. <laughs> the better it is. And I, and I agree that if they, the Little Rock School District would pick up Meadowcliff, we would do another school next year. So we're doing Wakefield Elementary this year. Another 90% minority, 80-something percent free and reduced lunch. And we are attempting right now to raise money to do several more schools next year. And another little footnote on this is the biggest complaint we've heard about Meadowcliff is from other teachers in the Little Rock School District mm -hmm. that say, why can't we participate in this? And so the Walton Foundation, Walton Family Foundation came in and said, what we'll do is we'll fund 50 classrooms to participate in this kind of a program. And we'll do another 50 the next year. So the 50 the first year, if that proves successful, the Little Rock School District picks that up. And then the next year, Walton Foundation does another 50 Little Rock. But so we think about it, 140 is a pittance. Cost, the, oh, cost. The, the Little Rock School District spends $260 million a year, which is over $10,000 per student. This bonus program at Meadowcliff costs $450 a student. But we got results. The problem is 
just putting more money into the inputs without measuring any of the outputs, you're, you know, why not put more money on the outputs, the results, you know, and then maybe we get more bang for our buck. Maybe we get more students educated. Students that, students, these kids at, these kids at the KIPP school that are scoring at the 81st percentile, they can go to any college in America and succeed. But when they were scoring at the 19th percentile, they didn't have a prayer. They probably wouldn't have graduated from, you know, UCA. If I could just make a quick point to that, because I'm going to pass it Sure. Um, and I'm not against accountability. I don't want you to get that impression. Mm -hmm. But I think that we adults, people who vote, and people in the legislature who make policy are cheating the kids by taking the easy policy way out. And I think that if we do continue to engage these strategies that work for a few, be it KIPP or um, the school you just mentioned. Medical, yeah. Medical. <laughs> What we're, what's going to happen, I think, is what's going to what's been happening and will continue happening, and that's those kids who do succeed wildly in that way will leave Arkansas and stay gone, and we will be here with kids who got left behind with the same system and the same problems. Well, I hope if we can improve the achievement of many schools in Arkansas. I mean, you have to start somewhere. You start with one, now two, three, four, et cetera. That, and we get this kind of articles written about us and things like the Wall Street Journal. People will start saying, hmm. Well, I agree. I'm just maybe saying, we ought instead to. Instead of doing one school, though, like, for example, even in Helena, West Helena, I think KIPP is great. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those kids are going to leave Helena, and they're trying to redevelop Helena, and they're not coming back. And you still have the same problem with those kids. Why not focus on um, <clears throat> incorporating some of those uh, things that are working at KIPP with those? And that's hard when you start talking about the hours that teachers work and when you start talking about pay and when you start talking about some of those things that charter schools are able to do and public schools aren't able to do it. I think that's where the fight is. See, I think some of those students, a lot of those kids at the KIPP school may not come back to Arkansas, but some of them might. And what difference can they make? Look at Bill Clinton. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He came back to Arkansas. There are people, Don't you know. know. Well, I know, <laughs> but, but anyway, I think there, there's, there's the possibility some of these people may come back and make a huge difference. Yeah. This, this is a hell of a story. Y'all may have seen it before. Yeah. Walter Wilma, how to thank you. Well, <laughs> you got to go back. back. That's an interesting subject. It's an interesting subject. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, absolutely.